what we experienced this morning is living faith. Living faith. Faith is not a one-time deal. All those who are born of God have a faith that is alive. And that faith causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. When in times of joy, we cry out, Abba, Father, thank you. In times of despair, we cry out, Abba, Father, help. But we always call in our Father because he is alive in us. And we are alive because of his grace. Today, we're going to continue our study of dead faith versus living faith. And again, we go to Jude chapter one, verse 17. But you, beloved. Now, who are the beloved? Earlier on in Jude, he said, the called, beloved in God, the father and what? Kept. Kept for Jesus Christ. As we go through this, we should not forget that. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18, that they were saying to you in the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions or drawing people to themselves. They are worldly minded devoid of the spirit. Now Jude makes a clear distinction between those who are called and beloved by God and those who call themselves beloved by God. There are a lot of people that say, yeah, I'm spiritual. Well, I know, well, I know God loves me. And then you watch the lifestyle. You're like, mm, it just doesn't match up. Now apostles and false teachers are nothing more than self glorifying false converts devoid of the spirit, worldly minded and causing divisions in the church. This is why I keep staying on this message because throughout scripture, even Isaiah, he talked about uh, false prophets. Jesus talked about false prophets, but in the church today, it's more about, oh, you can just believe anything. Just mention the word of Jesus. You can have anything you want. No, that's not the way it is. Paul even warned about these false prophets when he met with the elders in Acts 20, verse 18 in Ephesus. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility, meaning conscious of his own weakness and insufficiency in himself for such a service, for such service. I know Pat, you're feeling that way right now. Being called to be chairman of the elders, anyone who's called to anything should first understand, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not, uh-uh, I'm not. So what do we do? We turn our attention towards Christ and said, we can do all things through Christ. We are able to do the task at hand. We are able to face the trial at hand because God is in and with us. Again, verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility, humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. Well, why did he cry during the plots of the Jews? Remember in Romans, he said, if I could be a cur if I could lose my salvation for the sake of my own people, I would. This is how much Paul loved his people, but all they did was cause him trials. So he would cry, oh God, save them. Oh God, have mercy upon them. And this is the cry, should be our cry. When we have loved ones who do evil against us, when we have loved ones who refuse to believe, we still cry, Lord, and even when they're bringing trials against us, oh God, please save them. Living faith perseveres through tears and trials without bringing attention to itself, but pointing all to the author and perfecter of saving faith. We don't want people to come to Jesus so we can say we brought them to Jesus. No, we want them to come to Jesus so that he gets the glory. Verse 20 of Acts 20 says, 
how I did not shrink. Paul is saying how he lived amongst them, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. What? Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what I talked about last week? It wasn't about making the, making the world a better place. That was not what Paul did. That is not what Jesus did. His message was the mission. The message was the mission. He said, testifying to both Jews and Greeks, Greeks meaning unbelievers, those who are of the Gentile world, of repentance toward God. That's the message. Repent. Don't go around, well, yeah, I understand you confused. No, repent. But there is no repentance without faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There are people who say, I'm trying to live a better life. Well, I'm trying to do a lot. Yeah, I'm trying to get better. And so they say, you know, I promise God that I'm going to do better. And if, you know, if he would just bless me, I'd do better. That is not repentance. That's pride. Repentance goes through Jesus Christ alone. It is not about what we do to make ourselves better. It is through faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he has applied his righteousness to us. It's not our righteousness that's going to get us into heaven. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to us by grace, through faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And aren't you glad today that Jesus' righteousness is yours and God is looking at that and not your righteousness? Aren't you happy today? Paul warned the elders at Ephesus that men possessing dead faith would worm their way into the church. Verse 28 of Acts 20. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. That's what I'm trying to do. You may say, boy, he's staying right. No, I'm just doing what the scripture says. It says, be on guard for yourselves. First, I have to be guard myself. And for all the flock that the Holy Spirit has appointed you to as overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. That's enough to make you stop. That's enough to make sure that you want to get the word right because I'm not speaking just to people. You all are just people. You are the, you are the church of God. You are his flock that he was purchased by his blood. And do you think that God's going to tolerate someone coming up telling you a bunch of nonsense? Do you think he would ever tolerate me trying to draw attention to myself? I'm not that silly. I know better than that because our God is an awesome God and he is to be feared. And I stand here today trembling, knowing that if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, he's going to correct me once again as he did before. And I'm not trying to go down that route. Amen. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves, he, he didn't say, well, people are confused. No, he called them savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. But remember, 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 the flock are those who are beloved by God, called by God and beloved and kept for Jesus Christ. So whenever you see that, you've got to remember that though they may do all, they won't spare you. They'll come and try to confuse you. But if you are God's sheep, you are kept for Jesus Christ. Again, verse 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And men will rise up from your own number with deviant doctrines. What are those? The doctrines of demons, as stated in 1 Timothy 4.1. For what purpose? To lure the disciples into following them or drawing people to themselves. Again, living faith draws people to Christ. Dead faith draws people to man. Dead faith enslaves. Living faith saves. I'll say that again. Dead faith enslaves. Living faith saves. In contrast to Paul, who declared freedom in Christ alone, false teachers declare freedom 
in their system alone. False prophets will always have a system and they will always claim to have revelation from God saying that there is new revelation. I grew up in a church that was like that. They had a prophet, Ellen White, and they said that she has present truth. Truth that God gave to her for this present time. I'm here today to tell you God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Joseph Smith, Ellen White, all of them, they're all the same way. They got present truth. And what, of how many times does it take for a false prophet to be proven they're false? One time. She said that the South was going to win the Civil War and that England was going to come and help the South. Did that happen? So what did she qualify as? Oh, amen. Now, I hope those listening aren't breaking their tablets or aren't breaking their teeth because I, some of this goes to my Adventist friends. But I'm doing what Jesus did. And you'll understand. You'll understand why I'm doing this a little bit later in the sermon. We ought to call this out because what happens is false teachers will always bring attention to themselves. Gone to Ted Armstrong. Didn't he do that? It was all about them. They, God has given them a system that whereby if you follow what they say, you will be saved. And every church, hear me now. Every church that declares that you must belong to them in order to get to heaven is a false church. Catholic church on down. Every church, Church of Christ, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, 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 Mormons, Jehovah Witness, all of it. Now, do I hate them? No, I hate the system. False teachers, again, always bring attention to their system. Galatians 4, 17 says this. They are enthusiastic about you, but not for any good. They're not enthusiastic for any good. They don't care for you. Instead, they want to isolate you so you will be enthusiastic about them. That's in the scripture. Isn't, isn't the scripture full of knowledge and wisdom? Whenever you have someone that is strutting around and saying, well, God has given me special revelation. Run. Run. You don't want to hear it? I say this all the time, and I know I'm a bro broken record. Why in the world would the Spirit of God cause you to listen to someone who doesn't even understand the whole revelation of God in the Scriptures instead of leading you to the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit himself breathed into man? Why would the, Why? All the time they say, well, God has given me a word. God has given me a message. Oh, you got to come to church tonight. And this, you see, it says they want to isolate you. Don't cults do that? They isolate you. Churches do the same thing too. In order for you to be a good Christian, you got to be at church on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, twice on Friday night, twice on Saturday, all that. No, what are they trying to do? They're trying to isolate you. How many times is, now the new thing is when you go to a church, you've got to go to a beginner's class. You've got to get indoctrinated into their way of thinking. I'm here to tell you, if you're preaching the word of God, I don't need a beginner's class, especially I've been serving the law for 25, 30 years. What is the purpose of that? To indoctrinate people into their system. How do you indoctrinate people into the, system, the kingdom of God? Just preach the gospel. Amen. Galatians 6, 12 says, those who want to make a good impression in the flesh, meaning those having a form of godliness, but denying its power, 2 Timothy 3, 5, are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised, or in other words, to abandon the faith but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Isn't that what's happening today? You got teachers all the time sitting with Oprah. They have, she said, well, this homosexuality is sin. Well, or, it, you know, well, you know, if uh, I remember, um, oh, he was on CNN. Um, he had the microphone. Oh, boy, he, he was on there for long. Anyway, he was he was asking people, well, is Jesus the only way? 
Well, you know, I can't tell people's hearts. Only God knows that. I'm here to declare to you that Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, and no one means no one. No one comes to the Father but by me, whether you like it or not. But people want to change that message so they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Why? The message of the cross is offensive. It's offensive because the first thing you tell people is that there is no righteousness in you. Tell somebody they're not all right. They'll look at you like you're crazy. Well, I'm okay. What, what, is, what do most people say? Are you going to heaven? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm a good person. And a lot of people teach that, you know, well, you just got to be a, a good person. You'll go to heaven. Or, you know, you, if you do good, you'll get your wings. I'm here to tell you, God is not creating any more angels. We're not going to go to heaven. When you die, you don't become an angel. And God didn't take people because he needed people in heaven. God doesn't need anything. God does everything for his glory. Amen. Amen. Today, the issue is not circumcision, but being conformed to the world. The Bible is no longer our, to be our guide, our only guide for faith and practice, but the changing tide of social norms. You can't say that about that person. You can't say that. Oh, you can. If you speak against that sin, you're going to go to jail. Or if you speak against this, well, you're just mean. And, and Jesus, he was nice. Really? Really? Jesus didn't come here to be nice. He was not nice to the scribes and the Pharisees. He was not nice. Nice. Jesus was not soft. In other words, they're trying to make Jesus out to be a metrosexual, someone who cares about his hair, nails, and skin, and how he looks. That wasn't our Jesus. Our Jesus was all man. And the world will say that he was toxic in his masculinity. No, he wasn't toxic. He was the balm in Gilead that healed the sin sick soul. Living faith is willing to die for the cause of Christ. Dead faith is characterized by envy, self-ambition, and self-preservation. Verse 13 of Galatians 6. For even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves. However, they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh. They want you to follow them so they can boast in how many people are following them. Among some preachers that say, hey, doc, how you doing? How many are you running? In other words, how many people are coming to your church? In other words, in some, some circles, if you have 5,000 people, then you are qualified to be a bishop. Or you can buy your way to becoming a bishop. Titles are being bought. I don't care about a title. Jesus was Jesus. Paul was Paul. Peter was Peter. There was no title. Our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am here today not as an apostle. I don't want anybody to call me apostle. You don't even necessarily have to call me pastor. I'm Dana because Dana needs Jesus just like everybody else. Now, dead faith False teachers do not care about eternal consequences. They don't care. I heard one pastor say this, and it's so true. Hear me now. Demonic faith is better than dead faith. Demons believe that God is one. And they what? Tremble. Dead faith false teachers don't even tremble. They don't have sense enough to tremble. They do what they do without any regard for eternal consequences. At least the demons know when Jesus was here, they say, wait, wait, your time's not here yet. Send us over into the pigs. They had, they had enough respect for God. They, under, they could recognize Jesus and they recognized that he was in control. But these dead faith people, they have no fear of God. That's how wicked it is. They only desire to boast of their accomplishments and influence. 
Now, Jesus contrasted those who possess living faith with dead beat, dead faith, false teachers in Matthew 23, verse 12. He said, whoever possessing dead faith exalts himself will be humble, condemned by God. And whoever possessing living faith humbles himself will be exalted, inherit eternal joy. That's the difference. Living faith is humble. When you're going through something, what do you do? You cry out to God, don't you? You cry out to God. When you don't know what to do, what do you do? You don't look to Dr. Phil. You don't look to the latest tabloid. You go to the word of God. And you may call a friend or two and say, please pray with me about this. Why? Because you're trusting God in everything. You're humbling yourself. Prayer is an act of of humility, recognizing God, there's nothing in me that I have that can help me fix this. So I'm coming to you. Verse 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why? Pretending to be alive, but actually dead. You lock up the kingdom of heaven from people. In other words, they forbid the preaching of the gospel. For you don't go in and you don't allow those Entering to go in. That's an interesting statement. <clears throat> Let's break this down. The scribes and Pharisees castigated, persecuted, and threatened those who were entering the kingdom of heaven. Remember, they told Peter and John, you better not preach that word. You better not preach the word. And they whipped them and they beat them. People who came to Jesus Christ, their, their property was confiscated. They, were, they had nothing. They lost everything. In other words, they locked up the kingdom. They refused to have the word of God be preached. They're not going in because they refuse to believe and you don't allow. Get this. They said don't allow those entering. In other words, they hate the fact that those are entering the kingdom are going in despite all of their efforts. No one can stop God from saving who he intends to save. No one. Jesus, now why, why did he do this? Why, remember, these were the spiritual leaders in Israel. And as I called out a few people, Jesus was calling them out. Why did he do this? Jesus publicly pronounced condemnation on the scribes and Pharisees. So the eyes of those enthusiastic about these false teachers could be opened. He publicly said, you are of your father, the devil. He called them out so those who were enthusiastic about them could hear something different and thus be freed from slavery to them. He said in Matthew 23, 15, I love this. Woe to you, scribes, Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. There he goes again. You travel over land and sea to make one proselyte, meaning a Gentile convert to Judaism. And when he comes, becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. That's what Jesus said. Jesus was nice. What about being nice? He called them sons of hell. He didn't mince words. So if our Lord and Savior didn't mince words, why should we? The same spirit that dwelt in him dwells in us. And why do we speak out? To protect the flock that was purchased by the blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Dead faith is built upon self-righteousness and unbelief. That is what makes a person fit for hell. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They refuse to believe in Jesus Christ and they put their hope in their works. Churches will tell you, oh, you got, you got, you're not going to heaven. You, if, if you sin, well, you lost your salvation. You got to start all over again. Really? 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 You mean the spirit that says he holds us is that weak that my sin, we, then we'll sing grace, grace is greater than all our sin. Don't we sing that song? Don't we sing it? Sing it loud too. 
Grace that is greater than all. And then we turn around and say, well, God can't keep you. What kind of foolishness is that? When he seals, seals you, you are sealed. So the issue is not whether you can lose it. The issue is do you have it? Is your faith alive or is it dead? And Lord willing, next week I'm going to talk to you about how you get living faith. There's a specific way you get living faith, but there are no steps to getting it. I'll say that again. There is a definite way to get living faith, but there are no steps you can take to get it. Come back next week. <laughs> now, Paul, in all humility, expressed his living faith in Galatians 6, 14. He said, but as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. That's a sign of a true believer. Living faith causes you to be dead to the world. You don't care what the world says. You don't care what the world accepts. You don't care what the Pope says. You don't care what any church leader says. If it is contrary, the Southern Baptist Church is going through all kinds of all kinds of foolishness because people are trying to bring in the cultural norms into the church and they're just splitting all over the place. The word you can sing the old song says the church is one foundation. Is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is the new creation by water and by blood. When holy name she blesses, partakes when holy food. And that food is the word of God. Living faith proclaims the praises of one, of the one who calls sinners out of darkness into his marvelous light and causes believers to abide in God's word that continually reveals light. Living faith continuously seeks the light and the light from a specific place. And that is the word of God. John 8, 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth. Meaning said, he's saying you will know me and the truth. I will set you free. Well, Dana, where'd you get that from? Well, didn't he say that? I said earlier, he said, I am the what? The way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Where do you find out about Jesus Christ? In the scripture, both Old and New Testament. On the Damaeus Road, Jesus taught about himself from the scriptures. And the men said, oh, didn't our hearts burn? So when we read the Bible, we should be able to see Jesus Christ. He is, our, he is the one that saves us. And you will know me. Praise God. Aren't you glad you know him today? Aren't you glad that he is continually setting you free by speaking to you from his word? Living faith progressively separates us from sin, conforming, conforming us to the likeness of Christ. Philippians 2.12. So then, my beloved, again, the call, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Just as you have always obeyed. How do you obey? Through faith, it's not you're going, bless God, I'm going, to, I'm going to get this thing. I don't care what kind of sin it is. I'm able to do it. No, you're not able to do it. That's the first step in redemption, understanding you cannot do it. And placing your faith in Jesus Christ in what he has already done. And that he has given you everything you need for godliness and righteousness. We can do all things through Christ, not ourselves. So then, my beloved... Just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, one commentary says fear and trembling involves a healthy fear of offending God and a righteous awe and respect for him. Verse 13, for it is who? It is God through Jesus Christ who is the author and perfecter of our faith by the power of the Holy Spirit 
who works or is alive in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God in you. Living faith means that God has given you a heart transplant. He has given you a mind transplant. He has given you a desire transplant. And everything now flows through him. And the reason you obey is because it is him alive in you. Those who have never placed their hope in Jesus Christ do not have this and you can tell because they're trusting in their own works. Oh, you'll hear it. you hear it. Well, I don't do this. We don't do that. And we don't do this. We don't do that. They're always talking about their works. They're never talking about Jesus Christ and what he's done. If you hear people always talk about you got to do this and you got to do this, you're going to lose. If you don't do this, you're going to lose that. And you got to do that. That will make you so crazy in your mind. What settles you and gives you peace is knowing that God has already saved you and he is living in you to will and to do his good pleasure even when your body is racked with pain. That's when you find out who you really are. Because God is alive in us through Jesus Christ by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to do this. Paul says in Philippians 2, do all things without grumbling or disputing. When you understand what God has done, you're not going to grumble. Paul says, I've learned to have much. I've learned to live when I have much. I've learned to live when I have little. I can do all things. That's what that scripture means. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He strengthens me when I have nothing. He strengthens me when I have everything. It is God and God alone. Verse 15, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Did he say go change that generation? No. He says that you will be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach. In the midst of crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you appear as light in the world. And remember. I said all the time. Roaches don't like the light. Neither do rats. And people who do not possess the spirit of God have that same rat and roll spirit. Don't turn on the light. They want to blow it out. They want to shut you up. But what do you do? You keep on shining. See, you're not a match in the kingdom. You are a shining star in the kingdom. And who created the stars? God did. And that light, the psalm says, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan or anybody else blow it out. Why? Because you didn't put the light there. God did. Amen. Verse 16. What are we to do? Holding fast the word of life. So that in the day of Christ, Paul's saying, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. What is he saying? He spent his whole life Preaching and teaching the gospel in public and from house to house. Warning the people that false teachers are going to come. He first reminded, when you look at the scriptures, whenever you look at the epistles of Paul, he never starts with what you have to do to be saved. He always starts with what God has already done for you. Then he makes a list because of what God has done. Now do this. And we do it through faith because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And because we wonder at that, he say, I, I, I spent my life. So my desire is that I see you doing the same thing so that I know that my work was not in vain. But he knows it's not in vain because all that God, all who God purposes to save will be saved. As we live this life, there will be tears of disappointment, disappointment. But I'm here to tell you, the faith that is alive in you will keep you to the very end. You will trust him with your whole heart. 
And by faith, one day, faith will become sight. And you will worship him forever. But until then, your faith will cause you to marvel at his wonderful, wonderful love. His wonderful, wonderful grace. And marvel how a God so holy could love people like you and me so wretched. Oh, what a wonderful love. It isn't a wonderful love. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, <clears throat> for the truth, for giving us living faith. Lord, may we meditate on that, meditate on your word day and night. May we remember to remember, as we said on Wednesday night, remember to remember just how good you are to us, to remember your righteousness was given to us through Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we obey you by faith, not for our own glory, not in our own effort, but truly relying upon you and knowing that you've already given us everything we need for godliness and righteousness. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen.